Working in maritime shipping means constantly facing dangers. Every year, numerous sailors and seamen die in accidents, while others suffer serious injuries. Yet, this business goes on. When heading out to sea, sailors must be prepared for all potential risks. That includes hurricane waves reaching heights of up to 65 feet. These massive walls of water move towards the ship, threatening to capsize it. On the bright side, most modern cargo ships are designed to withstand any weather conditions except the most severe ones, and still stick to a very strict schedule. A really, really tight schedule. So running into a storm isn't just chance, it's more like a certainty. Big commercial ships can't count on dodging rough weather when crossing the oceans. Just a gentle and kind reminder to those who forget to hit the like button. Don't forget to give this a thumbs up right now so you won't forget later. Why don't those huge, iron, incredibly heavy ships sink or capsize? It's all about how the design works with the laws of physics. When designing cruise ships, engineers aim for the ship's average density to be less than that of the surrounding air. This is because ships float when they weigh less than the amount of water they displace. A ship's weight pulls it down in the water. This weight is balanced by buoyancy, which pushes it upward. So if the buoyancy is greater than the weight, the ship will keep rising. That means it won't sink. Understanding why the ship doesn't capsize requires knowing where these forces work. Simply put, there are only two main spots, the center of gravity for weight and the center of buoyancy for the ship's ability to float. If everything on the ship weighed the same, the center of gravity would be right in the middle. But stuff like engines, equipment, fuel supplies, all this weighs way more than cabins and passenger areas that makes the center of gravity shift downwards, so it ends up at the bottom of the ship. What about the center of buoyancy? Basically, it's the middle part of the ship that's submerged in water. The combination of buoyancy, a low center of gravity, and ballast keeps the ship stable even in rough weather conditions. Ever noticed how cruise ships have this roundish body and they're pretty wide? Well, that design makes them cruise smoothly with less drag in the water. It's way more stable than those pointy V-shaped boats. Rounded edges also help make the ship more stable, stopping it from rocking too much. Actually, the center of gravity and where it's positioned are crucial for any boat. Moreover, if you get it right, you can make a boat that can automatically right itself even if it gets knocked over by a wave. Of course, doing this for a whole liner might not be possible, but for a smaller boat, it's totally doable. And yeah, it really works. The high-speed boat, Thunder Child, is just impossible to capsize. Okay, actually, modern ships, even the big ones, are much more stable than vessels from a couple of decades ago. It's all thanks to today's computer modeling. During tests, ships are put through nearly every imaginable scenario to check their stability. They also tilt them at angles of 30 to 45 degrees to ensure that even during a strong storm, the liner stays stable and won't tip over sideways. Moreover, according to test results, cruise ships can tilt by nearly 60 degrees before they likely reach a point where they can't return to an upright position, though you probably wouldn't want to be on a ship that tilts more than 15 degrees. It's almost impossible to stand in such conditions, unless of course you're a level 100 acrobat. Otherwise, you'll end up like that toast loaded with butter on both sides. Got it? You know, toast always lands butter side down? Anyway, cruise ships also come equipped with special stabilizing fins that extend from the sides when needed. These fins help reduce the ship's tilt, especially in rough seas. Just having stability isn't enough to ensure a ship won't sink. When waves crash against the ship's deck in rough seas, they can add water to the vessel. That's where a properly organized hull comes in handy. The hull itself consists of strategically placed pumps, pipes, valves, and pipelines in the lower compartments. These components work together to deal with any leaks and maintain the water level in the ship at a safe and acceptable level. Modern hull systems also come with sensors to monitor water levels and pump performance. Basically, if there's a leak or a pump goes out, the crew gets a heads up. Another crucial detail is that when a ship is built, it's divided into several sections, creating an internal barrier. These sections are designed to be both waterproof and airtight. If there's a hole in one section of the hull, it means there's water inside that compartment. This design prevents water from spreading further and compromising the ship's buoyancy. Even if one or two compartments get flooded, the rest remain intact. This gives the crew time to react and take action to prevent a major disaster. The Titanic was the first ship to put this principle into practice, and it stayed afloat even after hitting an iceberg. Watertight compartments help the ship stay afloat for a while longer. There is, however, another theory. 
Some specialists argue that these sections actually accelerated the Titanic sinking. But never mind about the Titanic for now, since it's not the greatest example of being unsinkable, even though they did call it unsinkable. Let's focus on something crucial, ballast. Ballast is like extra weight that's put on a ship to make it more stable and to help balance its center of gravity. However, the weight it adds is relatively small, so for a ship that's not carrying any cargo, a storm can be incredibly dangerous. There are different types of ballast, for example, ballast tanks filled with water. This water can be moved from one side of the ship to the other. In rough seas or emergencies, this helps keep the ship balanced and reduces rocking. The bigger the ship, the more ballast tanks it usually has. Container ships also use ballast tanks to maintain balance and distribute weight, especially in challenging weather conditions. The ship's crew can adjust weight distribution by changing the amount of water in the ballast tanks. But let's focus on waves for a moment. When cargo ships travel across the sea, they experience six types of motions caused by waves. These motions involve vertical, lateral, and longitudinal shifts, as well as rotations around the ship's center of gravity. Yep, it's all thanks to those waves. It's one thing when they just interfere with the ship's movement, but it's a whole different story when it leads to serious damage. However, it's believed that the main cause of ship damage is monster waves. A few decades ago, scientists dismissed their existence, thinking that giant rogue waves appearing seemingly out of nowhere were just a myth. It wasn't until 2000 that the European Union launched a scientific project called MaxWave to confirm the widespread occurrence of rogue waves model how they arise, and assess the scale of the problem. So here's the deal. It's actually pretty serious. These waves are responsible for many extreme situations at sea. Ships sink and offshore platforms get destroyed because of them, and it's no wonder. Witnesses describe a rogue wave as a huge wall of water moving towards the vessel. Naturally, colliding with such a wave is really dangerous. At the very least, it can smash windows and flood the bridge. That's what happened to the MS Maud vessel near the coast of Denmark. So much water ended up on the bridge that it completely knocked out the power. Luckily, nobody on board, passengers, or crew got hurt, but the ship lost its ability to navigate. Fortunately, it wasn't enough to sink it. Just 20 years ago, reports stated that modern ships and marine platforms were designed to withstand waves up to a maximum height of just 50 feet. However, rogue waves can easily reach heights of 100 feet or more. Waves like these happen quite often. Studies have found that over a brief period, you could spot more than 10 separate massive waves taller than 82 feet all around the world. When a ship slams into a rogue wave head-on, which is the suggested approach for handling any wave, it leads to what they call bow slamming. When a ship rocks violently, hits the water hard, and does all that at full speed, it can sustain serious damage. Essentially, when a ship falls from the height of a wave onto the rest of the sea surface, it causes local crushing and buckling of the ship's bottom plate in the bow section. The bow plating also takes hits and gets crushed. And when the front structures endure numerous impacts over a long time, the ship sort of gets tired. Without routine maintenance checks, there's a chance a rogue wave can completely destroy a ship. That is, that wave can indeed wreck the ship. Actually, the repeated pounding of waves against the hull is the worst nightmare for a ship. Despite being built with thick steel, modern cargo ships can still be torn apart if the waves are large enough and the pounding persists for a considerable time. Sometimes, waves pack enough punch to literally bend a ship in half. It's not a metaphor. The ship just snaps and goes down. This actually happened off the coast of Turkey in 2021 when a wave lifted the front end of a cargo ship and snapped it clean off. Of course, this kind of thing shouldn't happen if the ship is properly maintained and repaired on time. The ship was built in 1975, so maybe that's the problem. It might have encountered too many seriously destructive waves. On newer ships, they reinforce the front end, the part that constantly hits waves, with extra support. They add things like angled pillars, special hull coating, stronger decks. Basically, it's the area you really want to focus on if you don't want rough waves to break your ship. When it comes to container ships, rough waves can cause damage not just to the vessels themselves, but also to the containers and the cargo inside them. And let's face it, containers often just end up lost at sea. And you can probably imagine how many of them are on board. According to a report from the World Shipping Council, around 1,382 shipping containers vanish at sea every year. But there's an even more concerning figure. From November 2020 to January 2021 alone, 2,675 containers went missing in the sea. 
A marine biologist estimated that roughly 12,000 shipping containers have been lost in the world ocean over time, with most ending up in the water due to weather conditions and accidents. The key to handling rogue waves is being prepared to meet them. In more professional terms, this is known as taking navigational measures in open sea conditions. The idea behind these navigational measures is to reduce the rocking motion. The less rocking, the less the ship is tossed by the waves, reducing the risk of damage. It's as simple as that. When a ship heads into the open sea, its hull takes a beating from some hefty jolts. Experienced captains know how to respond by adjusting the ship's course and speed as required. Plus, you need a bit of knowledge about how waves behave and how to steer clear of dicey situations. That's likely why obtaining a license to captain a ship isn't as simple as it may seem. It's a bit more complicated than meets the eye. When dealing with waves, it's important to figure out two things, the type of waves and their direction. The important thing is to position the hull correctly with respect to the wave direction. Often there's limited time to react and each turn of the wheel counts. Also, it's really important to consider the length of the waves in relation to the length of the vessel, especially when a storm, a really severe one, is out at sea. In moments like these, the captain needs to focus on two things, maintaining the steering way and avoiding the lee shore. It's best to stay as far away from any land or rocks as possible. Steering is essential to keep the bow facing into the wind and waves. If the main engine fails and the ship falls off broadside to the waves, it'll be in a dangerous situation. And no anti-capsize protection, ballast, or similar measures will make a difference. Isn't there a way to, you know, dodge the danger zone? Maybe skirt around the storm? Especially since the 1980s, weather info gets printed or faxed right to the ship's bridge. Captains also have weather maps, satellite images, and now even more advanced tools like onboard computers that help plan routes based on weather forecasts. You'd think it'd be easy to reroute and steer clear of those dangerous waters, but the reality is ships are on a tight timetable. Just the fuel to keep them swimming along racks up tens of thousands of dollars daily, so any delay or veering off course even for a short while can cost a lot of money. It's all about cutting expenses, which is why captains and ship owners take the risk. Although certain container carriers and other speedy commercial ships able to cruise at speeds ranging from 17 to 19 miles per hour in the ocean might be able to outmaneuver waves or at least lessen the severe impacts of a hurricane, it's recommended to head towards the part of the ocean where the waves are smallest and the wind is weakest. This area is usually located counterclockwise from the front edge of the storm. Some people believe that waiting out a storm or even a hurricane at sea is safer than staying in port. However, this idea is wrong and could end up costing lives. So if you have a choice, it's best to find what's called a hurricane hole, which is essentially a sheltered harbor with a breakwater and other protection around it. All of this will shield the boat from wind and waves. When a ship arrives at port, the crew drops the anchor, leaving enough slack in the anchor chain to prevent it from snapping under the waves. They can also put the ship's engine in reverse to put pressure on the anchor. Then all that's left to do is hope for the best. Being caught in the wrong port can be dangerous. When a ship finds itself in the wrong spot, battling strong winds and waves, it can end up being tossed and slammed against the docks, causing serious damage to both the ship and the dock. That's why in some ports, authorities order ships to leave during storms to prevent destruction. In other ports, ships leave on their own, but always at their own risk. It's impossible to predict with 100% accuracy what the consequences of a storm will be. If you've made it this far, don't forget to hit the like button and see you later.